Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Musab Ali Abdul Karim from Sudanese Researchers Foundation, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all to Trend SRF webinar series. We in uh, SRF organize this webinar series in collaboration with Trend in Africa, and I'm here with Maha Dahawi from University of Khartoum, and also Cynthia from uh, University of Sorbonne in, in France, and also with Vilias, who is our speaker. Uh, so let me briefly introduce him. Uh, Williams Masucha is an associate professor at the Department of Pharmacology and Therapeutics, Faculty of Pharmacy, Kuwait University. He received his PhD from University of Granada, Spain in 2002, and he did a postdoc at Karolinska Institute in Sweden from 2002 to 2006, and then he joined Kuwait University as an assistant professor in 2006. His uh, research area of interest are in the pathophysiology of various types of pain, uh, also in neuroimmunology and neuroinfections. Uh, he has published extensively in many reputable journals and he is very passionate about scientific writing. And he believes that uh, scientific writing should be taught in all sense related graduates uh, graduate programs. He has participated in several uh, writing papers, workshops, and schools organized by Ibro as an instructor and mentor. And uh, actually, I, uh, he was one of my, he was my mentor in one of these uh, workshops. So now he is going to tell us about uh, how to write an original research paper that will get published. But before we get started, let me take a moment to remind our audience that. They can ask questions by simply typing their questions in the event page on Facebook or in the comment section on YouTube. And uh, Williams will respond to these questions during the Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Williams, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. I know that you have a lot of information to cover. So now, now I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thanks Musab for the comprehensive introduction and also for the invitation. It is a pleasure for me to be in a person to talk about scientific writing. I really enjoy it. Today I'll focus on one aspect of scientific writing, which is how to write an original research article. There are lots of things which are involved in scientific writing and there are a lot of types of articles which one can focus on. But today we'll focus on the original research articles. I mean, what I also have to give a disclaimer. Um, Williams, excuse me, yes. can you share the screen, please? Yes, please, sorry. Yeah. Can you, yes, can you see yeah. it? Yeah, I okay. can see it very well right now. Okay, thanks. Sorry for the glitch. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll have to give a disclaimer before I begin. There are a lot of parts which I, or processes which are important in terms of publishing. I'll focus on how to write the manuscript. I will not cover cover letters, which are very important, and also the submission process, the review process, manuscript, manuscript revision or resubmission. Maybe in future webinars, we could discuss this. When we have workshops, we cover all these areas, but today I'll focus only on the original research manuscript. Now, normally when someone thinks about writing a research manuscript, that means they have data. And the most important aspect one has to think about, they should not plagiarize. That means they should not copy from other manuscripts. They should not also falsify their results or not or tamper with the results. The results are the core of the story of a manuscript. So if you falsify it, this is basically destroying the whole work you would have done, whether it's one figure you falsified or one table, this would be basically destroying the whole work you have done and also you will be making life difficulty for other scientists and other people who will be reading your work. Now, before you begin to write, you have to ask yourself a series of questions. I presume that when one is starting to think of writing, they already have 
data with them. They already have figures with them and tables. One of the first questions you have to ask yourself, do you have a story worth telling? I mean, we all have stories, but some of the stories are not worth telling because they are obvious or they've been told before. So the first question is, is my data worth telling other people? Will it convey something of importance to other people? The other question is, has this story or a similar story been told by someone before? So your data, how novel is it? Is it similar to what has been done before? Or it's an addition to what has been done? Or is it a replication? Because if it's a replication, it might not be worth publishing. But if you've added value to what was done before, then you might consider publishing it. The next question you have to ask yourself, do you think someone would be interested in hearing or reading your story? So you have your data, the next, but you are going to write a manuscript so that someone reads it. So you have to ask yourself, are, would people be interested in reading what you are writing? And also you have to ask yourself, who do you want to tell the story? Who are you writing for? That is very, very important because it determines how you write and how you put across your story. Then you also ask yourself now, okay, I have the story. I want to tell it to someone, which is the right journal to publish my story in? Which is the right journal to publish my article in? This is something which you might have to discuss with your co-authors or your lab or the other people around you. And this is very important to decide where to publish your article because it will determine as well how you write. So once you have decided the journal, you have also to think about the reading, the guide to the authors, because this will tell you the style of the journal, how you should write it, the size of the, uh, with the, size of the abstract, the amount of words you should use, the amount of references. So you should read the guide to authors before you even begin writing. Now, if you've answered all these questions, you can start now writing your manuscript. Now, when you select the journal, one thing you have to think of is to avoid predatory journals. So these are journals which will try to make you publish your articles or your manuscripts in them, but they will do some things where more like they ask you, for example, frequently, just can you publish with us? Can you publish with us? So more of spamming. And also so sometimes when you submit your manuscript to them, they don't go through a proper peer review, peer review, which means your article might be published, but it's not in a good state. It has not been looked by it by other scientists. And also you should be careful and solicited manuscript submission invitations. I suppose most of you, every day you receive invitations to subscribe to submit manuscripts to specific journals. I have put on this screen my junk email. I received about 124 invitation to submit manuscripts within the past two months. So you have to be careful. You should examine every journal which asks you to submit manuscripts or sometimes just ignore them. Now, when you have a candidate journal, you should examine it. You should think about what is the scope of the journal? Is it within my area of research? Is it in the area where I'm interested to publish in? You also have to think about indexing and archiving. So is it available? Is it indexed or archived in a places where people can retrieve it? For example, is it indexed or in PubMed Central or in Scopus or in JCR, where people can reach it, can read it, and can understand it. You also have to consider your area of research. So when you're choosing the journal, the best would be to choose a journal which is in your area of research. So if your research is in the area of neuroscience, the best would be to choose, I mean, a journal in neuroscience rather than a journal in microbiology. When you are choosing also the area where you publish, you should also consider what is your target audience. Is it the layman or are you publishing for specific scientists or a specific group within the scientists? For example, neuroscientists, microbiologists, public health scientists. When you are selecting the, a journal, you might also consider whether you want to go for open access or Inari, Agora, or OARE participating publishers. 
I mean, I talk about this because in developing countries, sometimes the universities or the institutes do not have enough money to subscribe to journals. So when one publishes in these type of journals, which are in Inari Agora or open access, it will mean these articles or their manuscript is readily available to people free of charge, mostly in, in developing countries. The other question you have to ask yourself when you are choosing a journal is, where are manuscripts similar to yours published? This will give you an indication whether you are sending to the right journal. Because if you send to a journal where all the manuscripts are completely different from what you are going to send, the probability of them accepting it also will be very low. The other guide which might help you in choosing a journal is where are manuscripts in your reference list published? So when you write a manuscript, most of the time you reference, you cite other people. So the people you cite most likely are the people who are publishing manuscripts within your area. So the question is, where are they publishing? This might give you also a good indication of where to publish. Why am I talking about selecting the right, the right journal at the beginning? This is important because every journal have specific requirements. And the best way to write a manuscript is to write it tailored to the, to the journal of interest. This will help you in terms of the structure, in terms of the number of references, the word count for the abstract and the style. Now, when you think of writing a manuscript, there are three things which you have to think about. Language and grammar, that's the first one. Content, that's the second one. Presentation, that's the third one. So in terms of language and grammar, it should be as good as possible. And if standard of English, your standard of English is inadequate, you can consult someone with, who is proficient in the language. Or if someone edits your manuscript, check that nothing is lost in translation. Because someone might be looking more on the language, but not understanding the science which you, which you want to transmit to the, to the reader. So when someone edits your work, go over it again and see that your manuscript is still saying what you want to say. The second important aspect is the content. When you are writing, make sure that the information you are providing is new. And, and also when it's new, make sure that it's useful and it's exciting. Most people will read something which they think is useful and it's also exciting. And your presentation should be clear and logically constructed so that it should be easy to follow. And when people read it, they don't have problems. They can go from the beginning to the end without, without any difficulties. Now, I'll go back to language. When you are writing a manuscript, make sure the language used in the manuscript is of sufficient quality. Find a colleague or someone who can review the content and language of the manuscript. So then they can tell you whether there are mistakes or they do not understand some aspects of your manuscript. If you are not proficient in English, find someone who is proficient in it to review the content and the language of the manuscript before you submit it. So you will have a feedback before even an editor or a reviewer has seen your manuscript. Someone will tell you, oh, I don't understand this aspect, or there are mistakes on this aspect, or you should change it this way. This will help your manuscript to be better. When you submit a manuscript, most journals will ask the reviewer to evaluate the language quality. Now, if the, if the language quality is poor, there are two things which might okay. Your manuscript might be rejected even at editorial level or by the reviewers, or there might be a delay in publication despite the good science. We write manuscripts so that they can be read. So if they are not understandable, the probability of them being rejected is very high, or they might be returned to you so that you rewrite it again in a, in a manner where people can understand it. I've just put an example of some quotes where reviewers write, I mean, one reviewer wrote, the start by XX8R provides possibly interesting data on the prevalence of bacterial infections in port to XXX, but unfortunately it is marred by poor language style, grammatical and typographical errors. They might need the service of a science writer, editor before considering to resubmit the manuscript. 
which means this manuscript has already been re rejected before they even even looked at the content or the quality of the science. This is just because of the language. Another quote from a reviewer is, the study presented in this manuscript provides interesting data on the resistance pattern of plasmodium phosphorus to anti-malaria drugs. However, the manuscript is difficult to understand. There's a need of extensive language editing and correction. Again, the reviewer is focusing more on the language because that is what is making it difficult for him or her to understand the manuscript. And even it would be also difficult for the, for the reader to understand. Now, when you are writing a manuscript, you have to pay attention to a number of things. First, sentence construction. It should be constructed in a simple manner, in a manner which it is understandable, in a manner where it's not convoluted, so that the sentence is very clear and simple. You have also to take care of tenses. So when you're writing, for example, materials and methods, you must, you must make sure that the tenses are in the past tense. So you make sure that the tense which is used in every section of your article is appropriate. One also have to think about grammar. Is it correct? Is it understandable? Are you following the rules of the language? In this, in this aspect, it would be English, which is the language which will be being used for publishing. And also one have to think about punctuation. I'll come back again to the issue of punctuation because punctuation can change the meaning of a list of words. It is important that you write your sentence, make sure that they are short, and if possible, just include one idea per sentence. Avoid complex sentence with multiple ideas because it will make it difficult for the reader to understand your sentence and if it's a reader has problems understanding one sentence, the probability that they have problems understanding the whole paragraph is very, very high. Now, I come back to the issue of punctuation. Correct use of punctuation is very, very important because punctuation can change the meaning of the same set of words. I'll give you the common example. A woman without a man is nothing. This can be understood in many ways. But if you write it in the following manner, a woman, comma, without her man, comma, is nothing. Everybody will understand that the man is what makes the woman important or is, the, is what makes the woman something. The second example, a woman, colon, without her, man is nothing. Now, here in this second sentence, the person who needs someone is the man. So the man without the woman is nothing. So who gives the value to the man is the woman. This is the same set of words, but the punctuation makes a difference. Another example which I'll give is also the use of hyphens. The following two statements might, will mean different things. So infection induced neuropathy. This sentence tells you, or this phrase tells you that infection caused neuropathy. So you are describing what the infection did. But if you put infection hyphen induced neuropathy, you will be describing a type of neuropathy. So the words are the same, but the punctuation has changed the meaning of the phrases. Now, when we go to the original research paper, there is a general structure of an original research paper. Normally, you start with a title, then you have the authors, then you have the abstracts, the keywords, and then the main text, which is the acronym is IMRAD, which is the introduction, materials and methods, results and discussion. And the IMRAD is recommended in the uniform requirements of manuscripts submitted to biomedical journals. After that, some journals will have conclusions. You might also have to write conflict of interest, author contributions, funding, acknowledgements, references, and supplementary data. Now, the order of writing. When you are writing a manuscript, the first thing you have to have ready is your data. That is your figures and your tables, because that is the core of your story. You are going to build everything based on your figures and tables. So you should be in a person to sit down, 
arrange your figures, arrange your data and say, this is figure one, this is figure two, this is figure three, this is table one, this is table two, this is table three. And this is the sequence in which we are going to discuss or write about our data. After you have written and put together your tables and your figures, then you will think of writing the results. After you have written your results, you might write the materials and methods, the discussion, introduction, conclusion, and title. This, the order might vary depending on writing style and preferences. But the first thing you have to have are your figures and tables, which is your data. And the last thing which you should write is the abstract because it should provide a proper summary of your manuscript. Sometimes you write your manuscript, if you write your abstract before you have finished writing your manuscript, you might change some things in your manuscript and forget to remove them or to add them to your abstract. So the best way is you write your whole manuscript and the last thing you write is your abstract. Now, I'll go over the components of the manuscript one by one. The first is the title. It is very, very important. Why? When someone does a search using PubMed or other in search engines, the first thing they see is the title of the article before they see anything else. So your title should attract the person who is looking for something. The, your title should describe the content of an article in the fewest words possible, and it should be clear and precise, and should reflect what is in the manuscript. It should not be un ambiguous. It should be clear what this article is all about. And you should avoid using abbreviations within the title. Because if someone doesn't understand the abbreviation, they might just ignore it because they don't understand it or the title is not clear in enough. Now, I'll give you an example of some of the titles which we produce when we're writing a manuscript with my master's student. We had studied endocannabinoids and their effects on neuropathic pain. The first title we used was the endocannabinoid system and effects of endocannabinoids on DDC induced neuropathic pain. It gives an idea of what our work is about. But one thing you would notice is one might not understand what DDC is. And also it's more general, the endocannabinoid system. So it's more of a general title. The second title reads, Evaluation of the Effects of Endocannabinoids in a Mouse Model of DDC Induced Neuropathic Pain. It's a bit shorter than the first uh, title, and also it's, become, it's telling what was done. So endocannabinoids were evaluated, but we still have an abbreviation there. Then we have the third title, Effects of Endocannabinoids on an Antiretroviral Induced neuropathic pain in a mouse model. Now we, almost everybody will understand what an antiretroviral is. They might not know what DDC is, but they will know what an antiretroviral is, which means you increase the number of people who will be interested in your article. But still, it doesn't say what the endocannabinoids say, what the endocannabinoids do. The fourth title, which we ended up with, which we eventually published with is Anti-Hyperalgesic Activities of Endocannabinoids Nabinoids in a mouse model of antiretroviral induced neuropathic pain. This title, I think, tells the whole story. We evaluated an endocannabinoids, they had antihypergesic activities, we used demise, and we were, taught, we were working on neuropathic pain. And this type of neuropathic is antiretroviral induced neuropathic pain. The whole idea of the title is it should be understandable, it should attract the reader and say, this is what I want to read about. After the title, in most cases comes the names. Now, author names, you should be consistent with how you write your name. Choose one and stick to it. In terms of spelling, in terms of the order of the names, preferably it should be as, as it appears in your national identification documents, your passport or your ID. This is important for the reader and potential employer because if you change your names consistently, someone will not know whether it is the same author or these are different authors. And I mean, some of us have a lot of names. I have four names. For example, I'm Willias Farai Masochanjov. 
In some cases, I could write Willias Masocha. Some cases I would write Willias Mas Farai Masocha. In some cases, Willias Masocha and Love. So in some cases, I have two names. Sometimes cases I have three names. Sometimes cases I have four names. One, I know I'm the same person. But this person who will be looking for me would not understand that this person is the same person. So you'd rather stick to one name. So basically, I use Willias Masocha and all my publication will have Willias Masocha. There will be no Farah in it. There will be no of it in it. So there will be no confusion. Who is the author of this work? And is it the same person who authored other manuscripts? You also have to take care of spellings. So one has to stick to the same spell spellings. And another issue which might be a problem, for example, in the Arabic speaking world is, for example, Al or El. For example, you can say Al Masocha or El Masocha. That means these are not the same author. And even when you say Al Masocha with a hyphen or Al Masocha with space or with no space, this will be completely different names. So you have to stick whether you're using Alma Socha with a hyphen, Alma Socha together or with space. That is very, very important so that someone can find your work easily. Now, since we are, we are talking about authors, we also have to think about authorship. Policy regarding authorship might vary, but the International Committee of Medical General Editors recommends that authorship be based on meeting all of the following criteria. The first one, the author should have substantially contributed to the conception or design of the work or the acquisition, analysis, or interpretation of data for the work. So this is the first criteria. The second, the author should have been involved in the drafting of the manuscript or revising it critically for important intellectual content. The third one, the author should approve the final version to be published. And the, la the fourth and the last one, the author should be in agreement, should agree to be accountable for all aspects of the work in ensuring that questions related to the accuracy or integrity of any part of the work are appropriately investigated and resolved. So when you are an author, you should be, you should know that you are responsible for everything that is published in that manuscript. Now, if there happens to be someone who does not fulfill these four criteria, then they might be added into the acknowledgements. Now, in authorship, you should avoid leaving out authors who should be included. So someone contributed to the work, they did the experiments, they were involved in the writing, but you remove them from the authorship. That should not be done. And this is when what we call ghost authorship. It should be avoided. Also, you should avoid gift authorship. That is, you give someone, you put someone as an author of a manuscript when they didn't do enough to merit to be on that manuscript. When you are thinking of authorship, you, you should also think of the order of the authors. Now, this is a topic where various publications exist, and normally the group should agree on the order of the authorship, who becomes the first author, the second, the third, or the last author. In most cases, the first author is someone who did most of the work, and the last author is the most senior. And the corresponding author, most of the time, is either the first author or senior author of the, from the institution. Sometimes the corresponding author is a senior person because the first author is a student or postdoc who will be leaving the institution very soon. Now, I have put an example of manuscripts or articles which describe about the sequence of authorship. And this depends with the subject area, with the journal as well, with the authors and their agreement. But you should think about it before you write or when you are writing the manuscript, like who is going to be the first author, who is going to be the second, and who is going to be the last author. Now, after you you have dealt with the issue of authorship. You should also think about keywords. De why is it important to think about keywords? They determine whether your article is found or not. Effective keywords, when used to search for articles, should retain relevant articles, neither too many nor too few. They should not be general. 
general. For example, if I'm going to send an article to a journal of neuroscience, to a journal of neuroscience, I should not use the word neuroscience as my keyword because for that group of people, it would be a very general term. And also my keywords should not be very narrow. For example, if you are studying an infection occurring in a small village, you should not use the name of the small village as a keyword because most people will not even look for it. The idea of keywords is someone use, when someone looks for your article, when they type the keyword, they should be in a position to find it. So the combination of keywords is very, very important. You should make sure that the number of keywords you put and their combination helps the reader to get to your article. After the keywords, the other important aspect is the abstract. This is one part of the article which is freely available. So when someone searches, they will see the title of the article. And then when they are interested, they open and they will see the abstract. And when they read the abstract, it will determine whether they will read the whole article or they will ignore it. Because they say from the abstract, no, this is, what, this is not what I'm interested in. The abstract normally provides the following information in brief. The length of the abstract varies from journal to journal. Some journals ask for 100 words only. Some ask for 500 words. So this is also journal dependent. In the abstract, you should put information about why was the study done, which is basically a brief background and the objective, the methods which were used, of course, minimal details, the key results, interpretation of the results and conclusion. So basically your abstract should be understandable that this is the work which was done, this is what the work which was done means and why is it interesting. The abstract can be structured or freestyle. This depends with the journal. That's why it is very important to read the, the instructions to the author before you even write your manuscript. The introduction, that is the background of your work. It should not be very long. One to two pages should be sufficient. It should tell the reader why your work is relevant. So you're introduce, you introducing your work. Introduce what is known about what you are working on. So what is known, what was done before you, what is the gap, what is the problem? So what is the problem you were trying to solve? Or what is the gap of knowledge which you were trying to, to fill when you were doing your experiments? And then what did you intend to do and achieve? So three, four paragraphs should be sufficient in an introduction. Avoid making a very long introduction because it might put a reader off. The whole idea of introduction is should, be, should be very concise, understandable, and introduce the reader to your work. After introduction comes the materials and methods. One important aspect, it should conform with ethical rules. If the study includes humans or animals, approval from an ethics committee should have been obtained and information supplied in this section. So you should put your ethical approval within the materials and methods. The materials and methods tells the reader how the work was done. It should be detailed enough so that the work is reproducible by an interested reader or scientist. So someone might read your article just to understand the methods. You should also cite previously published methods. So if you cite a previously published methods, which, method which was detailed, you should cite it and give a brief description. Make sure you have proper controls when you are writing your materials and methods. In terms of language, you should write in past tense. It can either be in passive or active voice, and this is also dependent on the journal which you are submitting to. The results, that is the next section after materials and methods. They should present the findings of the experiments described in the methods section. So the results and the methods should go in hand in hand. You should not have results where there are no methods and you should not have methods where you do not present the results. Write the main findings. So you do not write everything you did. You write the main findings. And your, what you write in the results section should complement what is shown in the figures and tables. I will discuss figures and tables in the next slides. In the results section, you should also include statistical analysis. So was it statistically significant or it was 
non-statistically significant. You should not ignore data which is non-statistically significant or negative results. You should describe it in your results section. The other important aspect when you are writing your results, you should show, don't just tell. So the reader should be in a person to understand what is going on. And also do not skip. So you should, your results should be in an order. For example, if you are using a plant extract, before you tell the reader about what the plant extract did or whether the plant extract reduced infection, induced microglia activation, for example, you should first show them that the inf the, there was an infection and the infection induced microglia activation. That would be your first. And then you follow it. So, okay, I used my plant extract and it inhibited or it reduced the microglia activation. So it should be in a chronological manner. It should be in an orderly way where someone understands the first part and then it leads to the next part. Now, in the results sections, you have figures and tables. And figures and tables are the most common way to present results. They are the core of the manuscript. This, that is the basis of what you are going to write and what you are writing in the manuscripts. Figures and, legend, and tables have captions and legends, and the legends must be detailed enough such that figures and tables are understood on their own. So when someone looks at a figure and looks at the, reads the figure legend, legend, they should be in a position to understand the figure without referring to the text. When you use abbreviations in a figure, they should be defined in the figure legend, legends. You should also avoid duplicating results. For example, results which you write in the text and then you write them in the figures and then you write in the tables. They should be complementary, not duplicated. When you do figures, you should avoid crowding them. They should be simple and easy to understand to the reader. So do not overload your tables or make them complex because why you are making a table is for the reader to understand it, to extract information from it. So if it's very complex, it will be very difficult for the reader to extract information from it. Make sure all the text in the figure and photos are in English only. That is if you are submitting to a journal which is in English. Use color only when necessary. So don't use color because it looks nice. It should be there because it adds value to your figure or it makes your figure understandable. Each photograph should have a scale bar in a corner. So when those who have figures which contains photographs, there should be a scale bar so that someone understands what is the size of what they are looking at exactly. You should make sure that the quality of the figures and the table is the best possible and they are easy to understand. Now I'll go to tables. Tables should be written such that they are read horizontally from left to right not from right to left. So when you have a table, it should be read from left to right. I have given an example of a table. So it's about epilepsy. When you look at the first table, you will see that it is wrongly done. One, the percentages will not add up when you go from left to right. And when you look at the second table, when you go from left to right, you will see that the numbers add up. And when you go from top to bottom, the numbers and the percentages add up. It is very, very important when you are making a table that it is understandable and it is being read from left to right and from up down. In terms of figures, you should also avoid making them very complicated. I have put an example of a figure where a lot of data is put in together which makes it difficult for the reader to understand, for example, when did the treatment begin? When was the disease induced? And also there's an abbreviation which is not defined and the reader might not understand, not understand what is D14. And then the next slide, I've put an example of how you can break down that figure into two. So into figure A and into figure B. And figure A is simple, it shows that Basically, when you, someone gave stavudine, which is D14, 
they induced thermal hyperalgesia in mice. So that is figure A. So now in figure B, I show and I've reduced the number of lines. There are only two lines which are in there. I'm comparing animals which were treated with VACO and the animals which were treated with the drug or the plant extract of interest. So it's easier for the reader to understand, okay, this is the effect of the plant of interest. Of interest. Now, this is another figure where someone was doing chronic treatment. And it's again, it's very difficult to understand. And this figure could be broken down so that someone understands when did the treatment begin? When did the pain begin? And what does the red line mean? Another thing, if you are using, for example, you are using uh, photographs, they should be in a chronological manner. So I've put three figures here. The first figure, A, shows the infected animal, B, without treatment, B, the infected with treatment, C, non-infected animal. So basically, it's not in a chronological order. And also, if you look at figure C, it's much bigger than figure A and B. And the second figure is an, improve, an improved version of the first one. Now, all the figures are of the same size. Then the last one, which is figure three, it is now made in a sequence such that A, it shows how the microglia or the astrocytes appear when there's no infection. That is the beginning. So you know, see how the astrocytes appear where there's no infection. B, you see where, how the astrocytes appear when there's an infection. C, you see how the astrocytes appear when there's an infection, but the animal has been treated. So it's easier for the reader to understand, okay, this is what it, they normally appear. This is what happens when there's an infection. This is what happens when the infection has been treated. After you have done, you have written your results and your figures and your tables, the next section is the discussion section. This is a very important section of the manuscript. This is where you discuss your findings. You explain the meaning of your findings. The first paragraph should state your findings, which should relate to the question objective outlined in your introduction. So your discussion and introduction, they should go hand in hand. So because you propose to do this in your introduction, now you should say, what was the outcome of what you proposed to do? What were the results? Now, when you have just stated your findings briefly, you go on to provide an interpretation of your findings. What do your findings mean? How do they compare with those reported by other groups? If there are different, explain why the differences ex exist. What was different? Why are your results different from others? Explain also the limitations of your findings. So what you found, maybe it could be improved. What is it that you didn't do or you could not do? You should also not over-speculate. Over so don't speculate too much in the discussion section. Or try to give statements beyond what your results can support. Your discussion should be about your results and what they mean. Do not in introduce new information or ideas not related to your study. So don't try to introduce something completely different or which was not in your introduction, not in your results, not in your methods, and it's not related to what you found. Your discussion should be constructed in a manner that it leads to a conclusion. So you present your findings, what they, you discuss what they mean, how they compare with others, and you discuss what they mean, and you come to a conclusion. Now, in some journals, you, after the discussion, you have the conclusion section. The conclusion section is not another abstract. It's completely different from the abstract. It should present general, general and specific conclusion. It should indicate what are the possible extensions and uses of your findings. 
you can also suggest further or future experiments. You should not overreach the significance of your findings. So you should not try to say your findings mean something or are significant in something which is not shown in your data. So if you have done a study using animals, do not make conclusions which seem to as if you have done a clinical trial. There is a difference between someone who has done basic research with animals and someone who has done clinical trials. So your findings should suggest maybe what can be done or how clinical trials could be done or how it can be used in human beings. But it shouldn't be as if now you can recommend a drug, for example, if you find a drug to be useful in animals, that you recommend that it be used in human beings. You can recommend that it should be considered for further studies, for example, in human beings, rather than say it should be recommended for treatment. References. It is very, very important that you format the reference correctly. That is one of the things the editor will look at. And it will be also almost like a sign of lack of respect when you submit a manuscript and your reference are not in a correct order. They are not formatted correctly. They, are don't, they don't follow the recommendations of the journal. So you should read and follow the format of the journal provided in the guide to authors. You should look at your reference very, very critically and carefully before you submit your manuscript. You can also use reference management software if available. An example of a reference software which I use is EntNote, and there's also a reference manager, and there are a lot of other reference management softwares which help you to reduce errors. For example, that means all the journals which you write will be written in the same style, will be abbreviated in the same way, the names of the author and their initials will be written in the same order, in the same way. When in your references or when you are writing, you should avoid citing unpublished material if possible. And also avoid citing articles written in a language difficult for the readers to understand or access. So you should aim to include references where the reader can look for them, search for them, and read them and understand them. There are some cases where you have to cite a reference maybe in a language which is not English, but it's a very important. You do it when it's absolutely necessary. After references in some journals, you might have to provide supplementary materials. Basically, supplementary materials are data that do not fit into the main body of the article, but support the article. For example, some journals will require raw data. So raw data would not be in your main manuscript, but it could be under the supplementary material, under the supplementary materials. The supplementary materials do not form part of the printed of the printed article, but they are available online with the published article, which is important for someone, for example, when they want to see more information which could not fit into the printed material. There are other issues also which you should take into consideration when you are writing a manuscript abbreviations. This is very, very important. Define them on the first use. In the abstract, if you are using it more than once, and in the main text. So do not just use abbreviations without defining them. And when you have defined them in the first place, then don't continue defining them again. Define them once at the beginning, and then use the abbreviation consistently. In some cases, there's no need to define established abbreviations such as DNA and RNA. Also, that is dependent on which type of journal you're submitting to, which type of readership the journal is aiming at or you are aiming at. If a term is used once, do not use an abbreviation. There's no need to use an abbreviation. If possible, also avoid acronyms. Why? Because it can make it difficult for the reader to understand your article. Because if you use an acronym, which, is the, which makes the reader go back to the place where you defined every time they come across it, or you have two main acronyms, so the reader has to keep track of 
what this acronym means, what this acronym means, where was it defined? It makes the reading of your article very difficult. So avoid if possible. You should also state or declare conflict of interest. So if it exists, you should declare that conflict of interest exists. exists. Maybe you were paid by a pharmaceutical company and you are working on the drug from that same company. You should be in a position to declare that. If there's none, you should also write there's no conflict of interest. Now, after you have written your manuscript, you should sit down and also ask yourself a number of questions. The first question is, is my manuscript understandable? So if someone reads it, who didn't do the experiments, who didn't write the manuscript, can they understand it? So in that aspect, you should give it to someone and they can give you feedback and tell them, yes, I understand it. Now, if someone raises issues of language, you should make sure that you have corrected them. Language is very, very important because if someone cannot understand what you are writing, even if the science is very good, it doesn't help them. They have to understand what you did. What is the meaning of the science? It has to be in a language which the reader understands. You also have to ask yourself, if I obeyed all ethical rules and put all the required information about ethical approval in the materials and method, you should always put ethical approval. You should also ask yourself, has my manuscript been revised and seen by all authors? Because when someone is an author, they should agree with all the content which is in the manuscript because they are responsible for the whole manuscript, not part of the manuscript. So every author should revise and read and agree with the final version which you submit for publication. Now, you should also ask yourself, does my manuscript conform with the guidelines of the journal I'm going to submit to? Because journals have, some journals have limited space, so they have specific number of words for the abstract. If your abstract is 510 words instead of 500, it will not go through. You will have to redo it again because the journal will not accept it. If they say they want 30 references and you put 32 references, your article will have to be returned back to you because you have gone beyond the limit. So you should follow the guidelines and check where do I put italics? Where do I put maybe bold, depending with the journal. Now, the other aspect which is very important is to compare your manuscript with the most recently published article in the same category in that journal. So if you are going to submit your article to Nature, it's advisable that you look at the, the article which has been published in Nature recently in the same category. So if you are in microbiology, you look at an article in microbiology and look whether your article also is formatted in the same manner. One, you follow the, the guidelines and you also compare that are you doing the right thing? And then you also ask yourself, if I critically evaluated and am I, and am I satisfied with my manuscript. You shouldn't rush to submit a manuscript. You should read your manuscript, evaluate it. If you are not satisfied, then correct what you're not satisfied with. Maybe the data is not enough, then you should do the extra experiment. Do not wait for the reviewer to ask you to do the experiments or the editor because they might reject you, the, uh, the manuscript, because the data was not enough. So if you are not satisfied with your data, with your manuscript, then try to correct it. Make sure that you are completely satisfied with the manuscript you are going to submit in terms of content, in terms of language, in terms of style. Now, if you are satisfied with all those questions, you have asked your que those questions, you can submit your manuscript because now you are satisfied or the authors are satisfied that their manuscript is in the best form possible. 
Anyway, thank you for your attention. I'll leave time. I have left about five minutes for questions. Maybe we'll go beyond one hour for questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. And as I mentioned, I'm here and I'm very pleased to have Cynthia Maha and Inas in attendance with us today. And I'm quite sure they have some comments or questions. Maybe you can start with Cynthia. Do you have any question or comment, Cynthia? A useful uh, presentation. Uh, I think uh, uh, all the students and uh, already PhD will agree <laughs> with me on that point. It was really complete. Uh, thank you again. Um, I was having a, a question regarding um, because the first uh, step, uh, and I agree, um, is uh, to build your figures and your table. But uh, when you face uh, it, it's a real exercise because you need them to be really like aligned, uh, if I can say. So um, there is a lot of software uh, you can use, but which one do you uh, uh, advise to build these uh, figures? Software for figures. Yeah. It, I mean, this varies from the nature of the figures. For example, if mm -hmm. you are doing graphs, you can, I use GraphPad Prism. Mm -hmm. You can use Sigma Plot. Some use, for example, if they are using photographs, they can use Photoshop. So it depends, or Adobe Illustrator, or Adobe Photoshop. So it depends with the type of the figures you are going to present. Okay. I don't know, I don't know whether that answers your question. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, I heard about one called Illustrator as well. Yes, Adobe Illustrator, yes. Yeah. I've used it. It's very good for arranging normally when you are having okay. a panel. For example, you maybe have three photographs. You want mm -hmm. to put them in an order. I have used it and I like it. And also if you have to put annotation inside the figure. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Maha, do you have any question or comment? Um, I have a quick comment and a quick question. A couple of small questions. First of all, I want to thank you very much for this very impressive presentation. It was uh, really direct to the point, and if somebody like me in the middle of the PhD, he will be really directed to what we should do because now uh, Cynthia near me, she's, she finished with her script and she told me that uh, it was really informative for her. Even she wants to get back and, and redo a lot of points that you mentioned, so we can't be more grateful. Regarding my questions, I I was taught by the gift authorship because yes, yes. when you work in a big team and there is a lot of people contributing, it's really very difficult for me to judge what, what do you mean by um, a significant contribution so that I can put the, the person in the, in the work and I need to be very uh, uh, like practical with that point. And I need to know if there are certain rules that you adopted to, to get through this challenge. And my next uh, first question was about the negative data. I know a lot of people now talking about it, and I know that a lot of PIs and professors are pushing us to find positive data. And uh, when you say, well, this this doesn't work and this doesn't give what we are working on, it 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 it, uh, it rises up a lot a lot of discussions. So I want to know more about that, and also to be patient before um, like uh, submitting your abstract because we were discussing while you were talking that uh, maybe somebody else in the world is doing what you are doing and then uh, he will publish before you. So everyone is thinking about it this way. That's why people rush to, to submit to papers. So uh, that's all. I hope it's not a lot of questions. Okay. I think you have, you have raised three questions. Yeah. The first one is about gift authorship. Yeah. So gift authorship is basically someone who has not done anything that is the clearest one. They didn't do yeah. anything, but they are on a manuscript. Or they corrected the manuscript, but they didn't do anything else. They don't deserve to be an author. Mm. And or someone just collected data, but they were not, they didn't get involved in the writing of the manuscript or revising the manuscript 
or they didn't even approve the manuscript. So it's gift authorship. Okay. So an author should be involved in a number of activities. I think I mentioned four of them, which could be the design of the study or acquisition of the data or analysis of the data. That is the first part. Then okay. the second part, they should be involved in the writing or the revising. So they should be involved intellectually. They should be involved in the writing process. They should also approve the final version and they should also be willing to be responsible for what is in the manuscript. So if a manuscript is written and there are things which you think you are not willing to be responsible, you shouldn't be an author there. Mm -hmm. I so you should, understand. You should yeah. understand, sit down with the team and you all understand what is the manuscript about. Okay. So some people fit in acknowledgements. So if someone, for example, handled symbols, so the symbols were sent to the lab, someone classified them A, B, C, D, and put them in the freezer, they don't deserve to be an author. Or someone helped you with the injection of a drug. That's all they yeah. did, but nothing else. They should contribute intellectually and practically. So they should contribute to the writing of the manuscript, to the generation of the data or the idea. And they should understand the manuscript in its entirety. I don't know whether I have answered that, that question. That's, that's totally, totally answered my question. Thank you. OK. The second question, let me see if I remember. It was, it was, data. It was the negative data. Yes. So negative data, sometimes people suppress it, but it is important to publish it. Why? Because someone might also be doing the same thing and finding the same results. And if you all of you put it in the drawer, which means there'll be a lot of scientists who waste their time doing the same thing. Yeah, that's true. And producing the same results. And it depends also on how the hypothesis was constructed. So if the hypothesis was well constructed, even negative data is meaningful data. Yeah. So you expected to find this, the drug, you expected that your drug will produce an effect, but it didn't. That is negative data. So maybe if you were using mice, maybe the strain of mice does not respond. So you have to consider why is the data negative? Yes. Yeah, so you should discuss your negative data as well. Okay. And the last question was about rushing to publish. Yeah. You shouldn't rush because the problem is, let's say you do your manuscript hurriedly and you send it for publication and it's rejected. Yeah. So you lose more time because it's yes. not well done or it yeah. comes with, if you are fortunate, major revisions, which will take you two, three months to do it, you could have done it before it went. Because imagine you send it to the journal, the editor maybe takes a week, two weeks with it, or a month before they find the right reviewers. And then the reviewers come back to you after two months. So three months have gone. And then yes. they come, they say, do work, which might take you another two months. So you have lost more time by rushing to submit your manuscript while it's, it's not at its best. That's true. That's so you don't true. really gain by rushing. Yeah. I, I can't be more grateful for your answers and I move back to Musab to see uh, for, the, for the other questions. Yeah, we, we joined lately with, with Inas, Inas Ahmed Sayed. I don't know if she is still here with us today. Yeah, she she's not here anymore. So I don't think we have any question right now in our Facebook page. So I just would like to say as a reminder, the webinar will be available in our YouTube channel. And uh, on behalf of uh, SRF and Trend in Africa, I'm very grateful to you all for being here today. And thank you so much for your time. And I let me say just yes, at the end of this webinar in Arabic for our audience in Sudan. 
على بنيه بنحلم به يوماتي وطن شامخ وطن عاتي وطن خير ديمقراطي حريه سلام وعداله والثوره خيار الشعب حريه سلام وعداله والثوره خيار الشعب thank you so much and goodbye thank you so much it was a pleasure bye bye okay.